Yesterday, I showed you this booklet, which is a biography, a phony biography, created by Ashen Dodge, the subject of the pamphlet. And um, I read a little bit to you. There was one thing I forgot to mention. So uh, we're going to go back a little bit. What I want to do is to show you why Matthew Franklin Whittier's identity as the author of the Quails Travelogue in the Boston Weekly Museum is so important. I've mentioned recently and described how it's important in terms of confirming one of the medium readings that I had back in 2010 and confirming that Abby was indeed communicating with him when the medium came up with Matthew's first name and apparently the name of the town Methuen where uh, Matthew and Abby had lived for about a month and a half probably in late 1838 unbeknownst to either me or the medium at the time and that proves that uh, the medium did not pull it out of my own mind and he did not pull it off the internet. However, there's another reason why uh, establishing Matthew's authorship of this quail series is important, and that's because it ties directly in to Matthew's actual authorship of the poem The Raven. And I have gone through some of that before. I've never gone into it in quite as much depth as I'm going to today, so uh, uh, hopefully it won't be too much of a rehash for some people, but it's extremely important to establish that Matthew was in fact quails because then it's a no-brainer that he said as quails in code that he was the author of The Raven and that Poe was not. So we'll get into all of that today. Uh, before I start that, there is another historian who expresses interest in my paper about Charles Dickens. He's about to go into surgeries. Probably before I finish this entry, he will be going into surgery. And then we'll, uh, we'll look at my paper during his recovery. So we will try to keep him in mind today while we proceed. Send some good thoughts his way. Um, so here we have Scott's Dime Library. I think this whole thing was, was a scam from one end to the other, just a self-publicity stunt. But when he talks about himself supposedly as quails after he gets through all the self uh, patting on the back that he does he mentions quails's itinerary and he says that um let's see let me back up after attending to the duties that pertained to his position in the congress the world peace congress which he didn't actually attend that was matthew franklin whittier and becoming acquainted with many of the leading men of Europe, he made a tour in company with a small party of Americans through North Wales, Ireland, Scotland, Belgium, France, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Italy. So he mentions Italy, which I emphasized before, but I never got back to it. Well, if you actually read the Quails travelogues, you find, first of all, that Dodge is not mentioned or inferred one or the other. Uh, nobody's ident Well, there are people identified actually in the party, but not Matthew and not Osh and Dodge. But secondly, he never gets to Italy. And he's very upset about the fact that he's not permitted to go into Italy. There was a problem with his visa. And I'm going to read the entire section. This is to nail this down for posterity, you know, because this is evidence. And I'm not going to beat around the bush with this stuff. We're going to see that quails not only did not go to Italy, but he was very perturbed. And here's the reason why the backstory, as I personally feel it from past life memory, is that he and Abby had always wanted to do this, to travel Europe. They always dreamed of traveling Europe because they were very interested in the classics in the ancient world of Greece, Greece in particular, but Greece and Rome and the artwork and so on. So Matthew was partly taking this trip for her in memory. And also, I think he felt that she was with him in spirit. So it was one of their fondest hopes to visit probably ancient Greece and Italy. And uh, so here he's blocked from doing this, and he's not happy about it. If quails were actually writing this list 
of countries, he would not have just blithely included Italy. This has to be Ash and Dodge who had a copy of the official itinerary and never actually read all of the entries and didn't realize that uh, Matthew actually didn't make it to Italy and the party was blocked from going into Italy. Otherwise, he never would have listed Italy in here. So it's proof positive that uh, Ash and Dodge was not quails. Now, you know that possession is nine-tenths of the law or nine points of the law. It's very hard <clears throat> for people to wrap their mind around the fact that something they see in black and white in print is actually a lie. But there was a lot of lies back then in print. And I've exposed a whole bunch of them. And this is a big part of the problem why people are having trouble believing me, not because I believe in reincarnation, not because I think that I was this person in the past life, but just because it's in print. And therefore, it's fact, because it's in print. I mean, this is a powerful psychological factor here. But Dodge was a sociopath. He was a bullshitter from one end to the other. It's all lies in here. <laughs> he did not go to the World Peace Congress. He did not travel with this group on the tour. He did not get invited to Victor Hugo's home in Paris, <laughs> okay, which Quails did. <laughs> you know, Quails... Matthew got invited to Victor Hugo's home in Paris because he was associated with William Lloyd Garrison and was acting as a liaison. It's the only reason. He wouldn't have had the pull to get invited to Victor Hugo's home otherwise. <laughs> you know, It's because Victor Hugo was uh, a radical. You know, He was a social reformer. And it wasn't Matthew visiting Victor Hugo. It was William Lloyd Garrison by proxy visiting Victor Hugo and coming back with, excuse me, coming back with some answers, you know. <laughs> so Ash and Dodge, the entertainer, he wasn't even famous in Europe. He wouldn't have gotten invited to visit with Victor Hugo. The whole thing is bizarre, you know. It's, it's bizarrely imp improbable. And yet historians, not having looked into the matter, will just blithely repeat, you know, that Ash and the, the few that care will repeat that Ash and Dodge was quails overseas when it's utter nonsense. The same thing goes for Edgar Allan Poe and the Raven. But um, let's establish once and for all that Quails was very, very annoyed that he was blocked at the border of Italy and wasn't able to continue. And we'll get that out of the way. I mean, you might believe me and you might not, but you know, most people don't seem to believe me. So if extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, then extraordinary evidence takes time, and time is boring. But uh, you can't have it both ways. You can't pronounce me a flake who has no evidence and then be too lazy to listen to the evidence when I come up with it. See, that's not rational or fair. So uh, I have here, I didn't show it, but I have here the 1851 <coughs> edition of the uh, Boston Weekly Museum, and I'm going to use a big pillow to protect the spine and gently turn these pages, and here I am. Now, these Quail's entries were published a long time after they were written, like months after in some cases, because they publish them on a weekly basis, but uh, Matthew would send them more often, I think, from Europe. It took time, a couple weeks for them to get from Europe. So by the time they got in the paper, he was already back in many cases. So this is, let's see, this is December 20, 1851. Matthew's been back since mid-October, so he's actually back in the States. But this is written, he's in the Alps. And he goes on and on about that. And there's a photograph here of a Swiss chamois hunter. You know, there's a, not a photograph, but an etching. And he goes on, but now he gets to the part where he's blocked. We proceed but a short distance from the Italian frontier, however, before we arrive at a gate, a company of soldiers, and an Austrian custom house. We are requested to show our passports, and after a rapid inspection by the officer on duty, we are informed that we can proceed no further because we have not the signature of an Austrian minister. We inquire into the particulars and find them as follows. Austria, having the military control of Italy, she has for the year past refused to admit any person within the borders of that country who had not on their passport the visa 
uh, an Austrian minister. This is V-I-S-E. Um, I guess it's pronounced visa. This rule is adopted, no doubt, to prevent, if possible, the entrance of revolutionists. And we learn with mortification and indignation that it is known to exist by every landlord and well-educated person throughout Europe. We have stated in a previous letter that, Hearing it was difficult to gain entrance to Italy, we applied at the office of the American minister at Frankfurt on the Main to obtain information and to get our passports prepared as they should be. I just want to show how pissed Quails is about this. The consular agent informed us that the minister had gone italics a fishing for a few days, but that business was left in his charge and he would give us all necessary information. After he had signed our passports, we expressed an anxiety to see the American minister that we might know for a certainty that we were safe to proceed when the consular agent replied, quote, You have no fear, sir. I am the consular agent, and I have visaed your passports. They will now pass you to any part of Italy. Well, we replied, that is pretty good authority, for certainly the consul would not be likely to leave his business during the height of the traveling season in charge of a person who could be ignorant of so important a matter. Under these instructions, we were sent 500 miles over the Alps on a fool's journey, when, had we been rightly informed, we could have found an Austrian minister in Frankfurt and secured his signature so that no difficulty would have arisen. The United States consul at Frankfurt on the Main is a German, sent from New York, and the passports were signed, quote, for Ernest Schwinsler, United States Consul, G. Lindheimer, Consular Agent. And he goes on. He's pissed. It is high time that the American government should wake up to the importance of appointing Americans as foreign consuls. For the office is formed for the express and only purpose of informing, protecting, and benefiting the American traveler far from home. And however good-hearted a Dutchman may naturally be, it is not to be expected by any reasonable person that he can possibly feel that warm affection and deep interest for our countrymen when traveling in a distant land that is felt by an American born. The first point to be considered, I'm sorry this is boring, again this is evidence, I'm showing that Ash and Dodge, who listed Italy among the places that he went to on the tour, could not possibly be quails because quails did not get to Italy and was really, really pissed about it. And he remembered it, believe me, and he would never have included it in the list. The first point to be considered in this case then is our government had no moral right to appoint a Dutchman to this office. Second, Swinsler had no right to leave his office for the purpose of fishing a few days at a time of the year when his services would be most required by the American traveler. And thirdly, it would be much better if he is determined to enjoy these fishing excursions at the expense of Uncle Sam in general and unfortunate travelers in particular, one of Matthew's favorite phrases, to lock his office and throw the key into the river than to leave his business in the hands of a thick-headed numbskull who is totally unacquainted with everything pertaining thereto. And then he wraps it up. We are now within the borders of Italy but we have been ordered to take our departure with all possible dispatch. We beg permission to leave our baggage and walk to the shores of Lake Como that we may see her poetized waters. But the officer, unlike Schwinsler, fears to neglect his duty, and we are politely informed that orders must be obeyed. We are told that by sending our passports back over the Alps to the Austrian minister, they may possibly return with his signature in the course of a week or ten days but we have not the time to spare, and our little party holds a caucus to decide upon our future course. We are told that if we wish to reach Paris, our best course is to return over the Alps by the same route we came, the St. Gothard Pass. But if we wish to reach the south of France, we can return to Bellinzona, take a conveyance down the Lake Major to Stressa, from thence to Domo de Asola, and at that place take the diligence to Geneva by the Simplon Pass, Napoleon's route across the Alps. And he closes, after many epithets of endearment 
and affection applied to our worthy minister and his talented assistant at Frankfurt, we finally decide to take the Simplon route, a description of which we shall give in our next. We are, as ever, thine quails. So I think I've established that Ash and Dodge cannot possibly have written the quails travelogue, and there are a thousand hints pointing to Matthew Franklin Whittier. So uh, we now know that that rumor, which historians have embraced as fact, is an error, that Ash and Dodge has nothing to do with quails, that it was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier, and we will proceed. Now, now I have to go to my Kindle because I don't happen to have a physical copy of what I'm now going to show you on the screen and read. And we're going to go into some depth on this also. This is found in the June 14th, 1851 edition of the Boston Weekly Museum. I actually didn't find it for some time. My uh, physical volume just doesn't have this one, doesn't start quite this soon. So I found this relatively late. And um, he's writing from Boston, and uh, he pretty much goes on about his itinerary in a normal way, just like quails would. There's no need for me to read all of this. But he has told us previously that coming in the mails is a copy of what we now call Edgar Allan Poe's Ultima Thule portrait, his last portrait. And as I understand it, it was kind of, he was on a night on the town and stopped in to get his daguerreotype done, and it's kind of a wild-looking portrait. Well, Matthew, as Quails, tells us that he loved to go to daguerreotype shops, and he was very interested in photography, and he loved to go into these studios and look at all the sample portraits. Well, apparently he was in Samuel Massery's shop looking at Edgar Allan Poe's portrait after Poe's death, and Samuel Massery must have... Uh, mistakenly thought that if Matthew was looking at it, he was a fan and offered to send Matthew a copy. So Matthew Franklin Whittier has a copy of the Ultima Thule portrait. It has arrived in the mail, and he's going to talk at length about it. I think Matthew went back and forth with his ideas about phrenology, but at this point, I think he was more or less half convinced of it. And I have to give quite a bit of background on this. Because, I mean, Matthew went through a process, kind of like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grieving with regard to the raven being falsely claimed by Edgar Allan Poe. He was furious at first. He tried to, uh, to stop it, I think, through the pages of the New York Tribune, which he wrote for. But he could not reveal his name because he was involved with the Underground Railroad and the abolitionist movement. So he was helpless to really come out. Uh, the editor of the Tribune, Horace Greeley, apparently refused to print anything charging Poe with plagiarism without the, uh, the name of the person charging it. In other words, he wouldn't do it just as a, an anonymous charge. I think he was afraid of being sued, afraid of the paper being sued. We see this from the two correspondence section, which I'm not going to get into right now. It's in my book. But anyway, he was furious. Then he started writing satires about it, uh, coded messages, uh, accusing Poe of being a phony and, and uh, being unscrupulous and being a, a, actually a, a, a horrible poet and so on, horrible person. And then he tried to negotiate. He literally went through the negotiation phase where he tried to negotiate with Poe to admit it publicly. Poe strung him along and finally refused. And uh, finally, Matthew reached a stage of acceptance, or thought he had, where he, despite his strong desire for revenge, which he had as part of his personal makeup, he applied his Christianity, tried to turn the other cheek, and did his very best to understand Poe and to forgive him. And he comes up in the end seeing Poe as kind of a wayward genius who'd had a bad childhood, and as a result, had become extremely self-centered. Uh, but nonetheless, he gave him credit for being a, a, a maverick genius, which I don't. The only sense that uh, Poe is a genius in my book is as a sociopath, as a trickster. But that's all. He doesn't really have the talent, certainly not as a poet. I can say he has talent as a short story writer in the horror genre, in the gothic genre. Uh, 
but some of those are stolen as well, apparently, plagiarized, or the ideas are plagiarized, or whatever. So, uh, but Matthew gave him that much credit. So, what we will see also, Matthew writing as quails is writing for a conservative editor, and he's writing for an audience, who many of whom are fans of Edgar Allan Poe. So he's constrained on several counts. So what he's going to do is sound uh, like he's praising Poe. But he really isn't because he's going to tell us in code that Poe didn't write this, that Poe was a sociopath whom he's trying to forgive, basically, because he doesn't understand a sociopath actually has no functioning conscience. That That's beyond him with his Christian worldview, see? And he's going to tell us that it was actually written in tribute to Abby Poy and Whittier, his late wife. And I will show you all of these things, and we're going to read this whole blasted section. You can click out anytime you want, but this is evidence. This needs to be done. I'm going to read it and comment on it as we go. Before I do that, I want to make one more observation, and that is that, um, you know, I put the links to my article about Matthew and the Raven and Edgar Allan Poe underneath YouTube videos. Occasionally, very rarely, there'll be a comment. Very, very rarely, these comments are, are respectful. Uh, I saw one respectful one regarding my paper for Charles Dickens. It says, I'll look into this. You know, that's the best I could hope for. So today I saw one regarding the paper about the Raven. And if I remember correctly, he says, talent borrows, genius steals. In other words, he admires Edgar Allan Poe for being a sociopath. And that's what I want. I want these people that admire Edgar Allan Poe as a sociopath to admit that he stole the Raven. And they can admire him as a thief all they want to. That's fine with me. If that's their ideal, you know, that he was tricky and clever and slick, fine. Admire him for that. As long as they separate out the raven and see that as something he stole, I'm quite happy with that. So I consider that progress. Because these people who admire Edgar Allan Poe as a sociopath are never going to understand the poem. You know, they don't have the capacity to understand this poem. So I don't expect that. Now, he writes, by the way, friend Putnam, we must not forget to mention in this letter that we have received during the last week from Samuel Massery of Providence, Rhode Island, a daguerreotype picture of the late Edgar A. Poe. The following facts will show, to a certain extent, the great reason we have to feel proud of the possession of this really beautiful and striking picture. Now, I should mention that Matthew has always been fascinated by uh, famous scoundrels. He almost kind of had a collection of them, and he wrote about them. They, they intrigue him because, again, this question of he believed there was good in everybody deep down. And there may be very deep down, but in, in the terms of the personality, at the level of the physical personality that I've talked about when somebody incarnates, a sociopath does not have a conscience. He does not have a good side as a personality. Now, deeper down, that's something else again. How he got that way, I think it happens over quite a few lifetimes. I think it happens with what, I think it was Eric Byrne who talked about the script. He's the I'm okay, you're okay guy. I studied him in counseling. And he talks about everybody has a script, an unconscious script. For example, if when a child is born, his parents didn't want him, he may have an unconscious script that says, I should not exist, you know, and he'll play out that script, you know, not realizing why he's doing it. He'll play it out. Well, I think he's right, but I think these scripts come from previous lifetimes, not just from one's parents. So over however many lifetimes, one could get a script that says, I should not exist. Finally, you incarnate and it starts to come to a head, see? Well, it's also possible that somebody could have a script based on past life experience that says, nobody's going to look out for me. I have to look out for myself. Nobody cares about me. I'm going to have to take care of number one. And that 
gets worse and worse and worse and more and more pronounced as he acts on that script until you get a sociopath who was born with a brain that literally cannot feel empathy. See, that's my theory. But anyway, Matthew was fascinated by such people. He kind of collected them. So when he says that that portrait is important to him, he doesn't necessarily mean that he's a fan of Edgar Allan Poe. He may mean that this is another scoundrel for his collection. I'm not, I don't know for sure, but I'm just saying that's a distinct possibility. He goes on, for a number of years previous to Poe's death, the literati of Gotham, New York, tried their utmost to induce him to sit for his likeness. But owing to the misanthropic views which this child of genius had unfortunately formed in his childhood, and which had grown with his strength until he looked upon all mankind as little better than cannibals, having no emotions of friendship above selfishness, and ready at a moment's warning to take advantage of a brother's weakness, he could never be persuaded to sit for his picture, fearing that it might at some future day be used in some manner to his detriment. Now, Matthew was couching all of this, this biographical description, in the context of explaining why Poe didn't want to sit for his picture. That's just an excuse. It has nothing to do with it. It's an excuse for explaining that Edgar Allan Poe was a sociopath because of a bad childhood. And he brings himself in when he says, ready at a moment's warning to take advantage of a brother's weakness, because that's precisely what Edgar Allan Poe did to Matthew Franklin Whittier, somehow knowing that Matthew could not publicly defend himself. So Matthew has told us the whole history of what happened with the raven in one sentence, as though he's explaining why Poe didn't want to sit for his picture. Indeed, hundreds of his most intimate acquaintances are under the impression, even to the present day, that he never sat for his picture. And Matthew's incorrect, I think, because he did sit for his picture a few times, apparently. But some three weeks previous to his death, while returning from his last visit to Boston, he made a stop in the city of Providence for a number of days, and regardless of the entreaties of his friends, indulged to an almost unlimited extent his unconquerable appetite for strong drink, and while in this highly nervous state of mind, accidentally dropped into the Daguerrean gallery of Samuel Massery, and as he was highly delighted with the pictures placed on exhibition, he proposed on the impulse of the moment to try for experiment and see if his own likeness could be taken to look as well as those on the table. Matthew's probably just imagining all of this. Without a moment's delay, and before he had time to change his mind, the offer was instantly and joyfully accepted, and the full reflection of his peculiarly expressive features was soon transferred to a full-sized plate. It's possible that Massery himself told this story to Matthew. This being the only daguerreotype ever taken of him, which I think, again, Matthew's mistaken, and the one sent to us, the only copy of the original, which Matthew was probably also mistaken about that, we attach a value to this present that none but the lovers of eccentric genius can comprehend. That's what Matthew means. It's not that he's a fan of Poe. He's fascinated by eccentric genius, himself being a genius, he's fascinated. Matthew himself is an eccentric genius, so he's fascinated by eccentric geniuses, and included in that is the subset of people who were scoundrels, but still were eccentric geniuses. So this is part of Matthew's collection. And he says, for the gratification of our literary friends at a distance, we give a description of the picture. So we don't have any image of this thing. It hasn't been engraved for the Boston Weekly Museum, he's going to describe it. I hope this is interesting to anybody. Again, it's evidence, and I need to go into this. I, in my papers, I can only summarize these things, but we need to go through this every little bit of it. Mr. Poe had on, at the time the picture was taken, a fine black dress coat, but no vest. The deficiency of the latter article, however, was nearly concealed by buttoning across the breast the two top buttons of the coat. He had on a low standing collar around which was rather carelessly tied a fine cheek linen neck cloth. To describe his features and expression requires a more graphic pen than our own, for his is a likeness that is felt as well as seen. 
the form of his head when seen from a square front view as presented in the picture somewhat resembles that of Shakespeare's with the exception that causality and ideality appear to be far more prominent. That is phrenological language and I believe that ideality has to do with originality or uh, imagination, it has to do with imagination. So he's saying that it's no surprise that Poe was developed in terms of imagination. Well, a thief has to have quite a bit of imagination, especially one that creates a whole uh, false picture of identity theft. His hair is black and apparently wet, somewhat bushy, and looking as though the poet's fingers had been the only comb it had seen for many days. Now, it's interesting. He's uh, I haven't noticed this before. He's characterizing Poe as a poet. He's not talking about his uh, prose at the moment. Finely chiseled nose, though somewhat prominent, and nostrils distended as in cases of constant excitement and irritability. A small mustache, but no whiskers. Mouth small, but expressive. Eyes snappingly brilliant and black as the raven so graphically described in his poem. So Matthew is conceding the poem for the audience to Poe. Now, this would seem to be quite a contraindication, you know, for me, but it isn't. It's just Matthew playing along with what the, what the public believes. Eyebrows heavy, and one of them slightly drawn down at the outer end, as if partly to conceal the piercing propensity of the eye. From the base of the nose, there are four sharp perpendicular lines running some two inches up on the forehead, caused, no doubt, by the constant frown or contraction of the eyebrows. On his forehead, we hardly know what to write. We have seen higher ones, but so expressive a one, never, and until we had seen this picture, we were always under the impression that Poe either must have been drunk or crazy when he wrote that flesh-crawling magnetism story. But a sigh at the shape of his head sets us all right. The organs of ideality are as prominent as two large robin's eggs would be, placed one on each side of an ordinary head. Poe's head is, in fact, the best illustration of the truth of phrenology of any we have ever seen. And could the correct cast have been obtained, it would have been worth a fortune to Fowler. We ran across Fowler yesterday. He's the phrenologist. Mr. Mastery has the original daguerreotype in his gallery at Providence, and the public can see the, quote, counterfeit presentment of this most brilliant of American poets by giving friend Massery a call. This is a weird way to end this. Um, first of all, Matthew is, is deeply conflicted about whether Poe was legitimately a genius or just an imitator and a phony. Um, he's conflicted about whether phrenology is genuine. But the words counterfeit presentment is deliberate. That means that that's not just fancy language for no reason, because Matthew doesn't use anything for no reason. Everything Matthew uses, especially if it seems like it's out of context or just frivolous, is meaningful. Counterfeit presentment means that Poe was a phony in the middle of all his praise. And then when he calls him this most brilliant of American poets, well, Poe was an awful poet. The only things he published worth anything were plagiarized. That's my conclusion. Um, Al Araf was not his, I don't believe. Quite a bit of his religious poetry, any, anything that's sincerely religious in his early published work is not his because he was not religious. Uh, I've shown in other entries how two of Poe's early religious grief poems are completely at odds with each other in terms of their underlying theology. One of them is spiritualist and one of them is just fanciful or uh, it may be sort of kind of Christian like the resurrection but you know the, 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 the dead wife is lying in the grave with the worms crawling around sleeping and you know the ghosts are flying around but the, the one that came before that was knowledgeable about spiritualism. They can't be written by the same person. That means that Poe had a modus operandi of stealing the grief poetry of unknown widowers and publishing it as his own, which is what he did to Matthew Franklin Whittier. So Matthew Franklin Whittier, and we know that this is him now, this is not Ashen Dodge, 
he was the younger brother of one of the premier poets in the United States uh, of that era, John Greenleaf Whittier. He would never have uh, claimed that Edgar Allan Poe was a better poet than his brother, John Greenleaf Whittier, but that's what he's saying here of this most brilliant of American poets. So he has to be saying this tongue in cheek. And it's in the same sentence as counterfeit presentment. So he has to be saying in code, under his breath, that as a poet, Poe was a phony and did not write The Raven. But the clincher is the date. This entire letter from Quails, if you go up to the top, it's published in the June 14th, 1851 edition. But it's written on June 2nd, quite a bit earlier, almost two weeks earlier. June 2nd is Abby's birthday. The only reason that Matthew was keenly aware of this, the only reason he would ever publish anything on Abby's birthday is if he was telling us in code that he wrote this poem in tribute to Abby, in grief for Abby. That's why he deliberately dated this on June 2nd, and there's no wiggle room on this. I'm not imagining it because he's he's used these anniversary dates as code before. Now, that is not actually the only thing we've got to deal with here. Directly above this Quail's travelogue entry is a poem, and we've seen, if you followed this video blog, you've seen that many times that Matthew would use as code the technique of arranging with the editor to have certain poems placed above or below, immediately above and immediately below his other works. And uh, they might be his poems, they might be somebody else's. In this case, directly above this Quail's entry, which concerns Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Ultima Thule portrait, is a poem written for the Boston Weekly Museum, which means it's original, called Be Kind Always, and it's signed by Robert Johnson. Now, I'm going to jump ahead of myself a little bit. Robert Johnson was a plagiarist who had stolen Matthew's work in this Boston Weekly Museum. He was somebody that apparently lived on a city, I forget which one now, on a town that was on his route. He was a traveling postal inspector. He must have inadvisably shown his unpublished work to this fellow by way of mentoring him. I think a lot of times Matthew was mentoring people when he did this, and he would show them unpublished works, and then uh, these people would, instead of learning from Matthew's examples and samples, he, they would just publish the pieces that he shared with them, see? So this guy, Robert Johnson, did that previously. So Matthew apparently is strongly in a mood to turn the other cheek, to try to forgive. So this poem is specifically about that. It's specifically put here because it's showing that he is desperately trying to forgive Edgar Allan Poe. But at the same time, he's turned the other cheek to such an extent that he's attributed this beautiful poem to another plagiarist. I'm not wrong about this. It sounds pretty fanciful. I'll show you in a little bit the poem that Robert Johnson had earlier plagiarized from Matthew, deeply personal grief poem, just like what Edgar Allan Poe did. And this is what Matthew's trying to show is these parallels. But first I'm going to read this poem. Remember, this is really to, not just to Robert Johnson, whose name he put on here, but this is to Edgar Allan Poe. Deal kindly with thy erring brother. Let not base thoughts thy words control. All anger in that bosom smother, where naught but love should wake the soul. This is not, none of this is um, in irony, by the way. This is Matthew's sincere efforts to turn the other cheek. Deal kindly, for he is thy brother, nor magnify small faults too large. We here full oft condemn each other in that which should not bear a charge. Deal gently, sister, he's thy brother. Forgive the sorrows of the past. Thy kindness may, when can none other, reclaim the erring one at last. What if a friend with frowns should meet you? Say not his heart is wholly changed. Perhaps he had forgot to greet you, or thought intense might have estranged. 
frown not, but smile whene'er you meet him. Perchance his heart is darkly sad. Let words of kindness when you greet him drive out despair and make him glad. Be slow in forming your opinion. You cannot know all men at first. Some gloomy spell may have dominion and make the better seem the worst. A little word and kindness spoken may sometimes win the hardest heart and bring back years of friendship broken and heal what time has caused to smart. Forgive if you would be forgiven. Let kindness here expel all strife. For how can those e'er enter heaven who quarrel on the road of life? And it's signed from Norwich, Connecticut, 1851. That's this, the town I was trying to remember that Matthew would travel through fairly often as quails, which I know because you can follow his itinerary. So uh, this fellow apparently lived in Norwich, Connecticut. Matthew would frequently travel through, and he must have started mentoring this fellow in poetry. His other poems are nowhere near in this style. This is Matthew Franklin Whittier's style. Johnson was a kind of overblown, um, deliberately poeticized poet, if that makes any sense. He was trying to be poetic. Uh, he wasn't really expressing his, his real feelings. And uh, I think he had ambitions to be a poet, and the Boston Weekly Museum was publishing him. But nobody else was, so far as I know. And uh, apparently he couldn't resist publishing Matthew's poetry. So now we're going to look at the one that he had earlier plagiarized from Matthew, just to show you that I'm not blowing smoke on this. And it happens to be in one of these old ratty Boston Weekly Museums that I first purchased, not realizing that any of Matthew's work was in them. One of these had How the Cows Were Won, which is our uh, evidence concerning Methuen and the psychic reading, which I talked about a couple entries back, a few entries back. And this other one, June 8, 1850, I didn't even realize it was in here. But this contains the poem that Robert Johnson had earlier plagiarized from Matthew. This is a grief poem, just like the raven. It reads somewhat in the same tone as the raven. And uh, I'm going to have to bring my light down pretty close here. This is small type. Written for the Boston Weekly Museum. And Robert Johnson has given it a title, an absurd but absurdly long, wordy, biblical title. So we know that this was probably a work in progress that Matthew had not even titled. And Johnson slapped this title on it. This is, this is proof he didn't write it just here. Remember how short my time is, wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? That's the title of the poem. <laughs> well, that's the only thing that's original to Robert Johnson. And here we have the poem, if I can see it. Maybe I can increase my light level a little bit here. Make it a little more intense. That's better. This is Matthew writing not about Abby's death, but about the death of their child, one of their two children. They, they lost two children. And I don't know which one, if it was their son, Joseph, the one who partly inspired a Christmas carol. That would have been, I think, August of 1838 which is not long before they began working on A Christmas Carol together. If, on the other hand, it was their daughter, Sarah, Sarah died two weeks before Abby did. Abby apparently lost the will to live after Sarah died under circumstances that we don't know. One of my two psychic mediums said she thought that one of their children died in a fire. That's entirely possible. If Abby was seriously ill with consumption, they might have asked someone to take care of Sarah for a while and Children did die of fire because they didn't have flame retardant clothing and they would catch fire on candles and things like that. If that had happened, Abby would have felt so guilty she would have just given up the will to live, which is quite possible. So we don't know which one. If it mentions the sex of the child, we might have a clue. This is Matthew Franklin Whittier's poetry. I'm <clears throat> absolutely certain. Now we see the infant sleeping in his wicker cradle bed. Well, I'm going to stop and say this is Joseph, written in 1838, not long before they started A Christmas Carol. This is why they went to Methuen to uh, stay with his second cousin, Richard Whittier, 
uh, at the, at uh, Whittier's farmhouse, and this is uh, this is when Matthew had to just kind of spend all his time trying to pull Abby out of that depression and that despair. Uh, that's why they couldn't work. He couldn't work, and that's why the people of Methuen apparently started gossiping that they were lazy, and that's why Matthew wrote that piece, How the Cows Were Won, many, many years later. So it all ties in. I'm going to read this straight through. Now we see the infant sleeping in his wicker cradle bed. Then we find the mother weeping like a Rachel for the dead. Time here steals in silent numbers all that makes up life's brief loan. Since the days of childhood slumbers, who can tell how time has flown? Life for youth is full of pleasure as it gills the varied page. But how soon it fills its measure, bending neath the weight of age. Many, too, who with us started in the race of life to run, on the road by death were parted ere the promised goal was won. Lightfoot youth and old age bending, thoughtless childhood, middle life, all are moving, ever tending to that bourne where ends the strife. Earth for man has never given pleasure unalloyed by pain. Here our fondest ties are riven, never to unite again. Who, ah, who would live forever, heir to mortal pain and grief? It were best the cord should sever and the soul find its relief. For the boon that God has given never would to earth descend, but to fit man here for heaven and to answer life's great end. Jesus, in the garden lowly, groaned and wept lost man to save. Let thy life be like his, holy, and thou wilt not fear the grave. Child of sorrow, cease thy mourning, haste thou while hope's star ascends. Soon for you twilt bring the dawning of a day that never ends. So, um, there's references in here, but uh, I won't go into all of those. That's what Robert Johnson falsely claimed and put his name to that he stole from Matthew Franklin Whittier when Matthew was trying to mentor him in Norwich while he was traveling as a postal inspector. And when it comes time to talk about Edgar Allan Poe and to try to forgive Poe in a poem about forgiving one's brother, set immediately on top of the quails entry talking about Poe's photograph, which was dated on Abby's birthday, he has assigned this poem to his other plagiarist, Robert Johnson. I know full well that people will think that I'm imagining these things, and the way the skeptical mind works is that if they can't shoot it down on one count, they'll shoot it down on another count. And if you explain that, they'll come up with a third. It's all just sophistry. <clears throat> so if you're, as a skeptic, if your first line of defense was, oh, he can't prove that Matthew Franklin Whittier was writing his quails because the historians tell us in black and white that it was Osh and Dodge, you know? So that's the first line of defense. If I can prove absolutely, which I've done, that Osh and Dodge was not the author of Quails, and that Matthew Franklin Whittier, 99.9% .9 definite, if not 100% definite, because we've got his image, you know, there in Exeter Hall at the reporter's table. So 100%, that was Matthew Franklin Whittier. If I prove that, then, oh, it's a coincidence that he wrote this on Abby's birthday on June 2nd. Well, it was no coincidence because Matthew was in deep grief all his life. And he would never have used that date. In other words, if it wasn't about Abby, he would have waited and dated it on the 3rd. <laughs> Only reason he would have dated it smack on Abby's birthday is because it was deliberate. So if I prove that, then you could say, oh, well, this Robert Johnson thing, that was just Robert Johnson trying out a new style, you know. That wasn't Matthew's poem about forgiveness. Because, see, here's the thing. We've got clues in the piece that tell us that Poe was a sociopath, that he was, in Matthew's estimation at that time, a maverick genius, 
but that he was also a fake counterfeit presentment. But we don't really understand that Matthew was trying to forgive him for something until we look at the poem that's been placed directly above the piece. That suddenly brings in the theme of forgiveness. If you're forgiving someone, you have to be forgiving them for something. The clue as to what he's forgiving them for is, I think, the real reason he has attributed this to his other plagiarist who plagiarized another Greek poem from him, Robert Johnson, because that tells us what he's forgiving someone for. So we know who it is. We know it's Edgar Allan Poe. And we know that Poe took advantage of Matthew because he said as much, take advantage of a brother's weakness. So now we know that Matthew's trying to forgive Edgar Allan Poe, but what is he trying to forgive him for? He's trying to forgive him for plagiarism. And what plagiarism? It has to be of the Raven and actually of Annabelle Lee also because he's dated it on Abby's birthday, which tells us that the poem Poe plagiarized had to have had to do with Abby. And the poem that Robert Johnson plagiarized from him was a grief poem. So the Raven has to be written and Annabelle Lee also have to be written in grief for Abby Poyan, his late wife. So all the dots are connected here. And there's many other clues. If you read my paper, and I'll put the link to that paper down in this, well, I'll either put it here or I'll put it in the comment section or both. If you read my paper, you'll see a whole bunch of clues. You know, Matthew didn't leave anything to chance as far as telling posterity that he wrote The Raven and Edgar Allan Poe just falsely claimed it. That was the best he could do at the time. Because when Poe stole the Raven in 1845. Matthew could not come out publicly. He was actively involved with the, you know, Underground Railroad and so on. Um, afterwards, after Poe died, nobody would have believed him. So he couldn't come out with it then. He had to wait until some scholar, somebody in posterity, got interested and started looking into it. Now, whether he knew that would be himself reincarnated or not, I don't know. I think he was just beginning to entertain the idea of reincarnation or the pre-existence of the soul around 1850. So he probably did not imagine that it would be him. He thought that some intrepid scholar someday would look into this and reading Poe's philosophy of composition would realize that Poe could not possibly have written The Raven. Now, there is at least one scholar, I wish I'd retained him, his name, who read the philosophy of composition and knows enough about inspired poetry to know that it couldn't possibly have been written that way, the way Poe describes. But he wasn't ready to say that Poe was completely sociopathic and was just lying from one end to the other about having written a poem. So apparently his compromise solution was to say that Poe wrote the philosophy of composition in jest. You know, well, he did write it in jest in a sense in the sociopathic sense, in the sense that psychopaths are laughing at the police and giving them clues, you know. Uh, in that sense, as I said, Matthew would have said that he was laughing up his sleeve while he wrote the philosophy of composition. It was in jest, all right, but it wasn't in jest to make a point about how to write poetry, because that's actually how he wrote poetry, by pieces parts. It was in jest because he was pretending to have written the poem, see, and, and that was his little joke. You know, um, so I don't think I've left anything out. I don't think there's any more to go into here. Even if nobody watches all of this, we've got it down for posterity. You have to really look at these things carefully because I can assert them in papers and blog entries all day. And people will say, yeah, 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 well, that's his interpretation. You know, so I wanted to get in here and read these things and show you you know, when I did my documentary, I had one skeptic, and that skeptic was scoffing, and he says, I want to see 8 by 10 glossies. You know, he wants evidence, hard evidence. Well, this is hard evidence, guys. It's hard evidence that Edgar Allan Poe could not possibly have written The Raven, and it's hard evidence that Matthew, in code, told us in no uncertain terms that Poe may have been a, a maverick sociopathic genius, but he did not write this poem.